So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Elias. I work for Linaro. I'm nowadays primarily involved into firmware, and I want to talk to some work we did about embedded bootloaders, embedded systems, and what's the status of EFI in general, and things that we've solved on the EFI subsystem, or not the, EF, the EFI implementation on Linux. Uh, so the EFI is getting some traction into embedded hardware. Uh, there's boards and bootloaders that implement the EFI spec or a subset of the EFI specification. Uh, embedded boards, the embedded industry finally figured out that they don't want to boot a custom image per board and they don't want to customize every OS they boot. So they, uh, there's the EBBR, uh, which is a specification that's not platform specific. Uh, I think RISC V also uh, is also uh, trying to do the same thing. Uh, it works in U-boot and it basically relies on a subset of EFI interfaces to provide a common way for various architectures to boot an OS, uh, which brings us to the, the next point. So when you boot an EFI system, uh, you rely on some variables. Those variables will do various things, uh, decide what OS you're going to boot, decide some platform specific things, uh, but they also include uh, your system security. So you have your platform keys and your key exchange keys, the DB, etc. And the interesting part is that the EFI spec says that uh, this needs to be on a tamper-protected delete-resistant medium. Uh, what the EFI doesn't tell you is that in order to have that at runtime, uh, that's basically a hardware requirement that says the flash has to be under the control of the firmware forever, and it has to be delete and tamper-resistant. Uh, the status on the embedded board is not ideal. We don't have that hardware. Uh, I'm aware of some boards that have flashes connected to ARM Secure World, but they're not delete, delete resistant or tamper protected or anything. Uh, but many boards have an EMMC. And the EMMC has a replay protected memory uh, partition, uh, which basically adheres to everything the EFI spec says about storing keys and variables. Uh, I'm, this is not specific to U-Boot. I'm just bringing U-Boot as, as an example because it's the only bootloader that is compliant and does that stuff for now. That's completely uh, irrelevant. Uh, but it is it is compliant with EBBR for a couple of years. Uh, we can boot embedded. We can boot standard distros off the self distros as long as your board's driver are included. You can run the installer and boot the whole thing. Uh, and we have two ways of storing the variables. If your board has an EMMC, we store it on the RPMP. If your board doesn't, we store it on a file uh, on the ESP partition. Um, the way we present the variables to the kernel or the OS that's about to boot, we copy them on a piece of memory. We mark that memory as runtime, exit boot services gets calls, et cetera, et cetera, remaps that region, and then we can access the variables. Um, we only have get variable and get next variable. Uh, nothing else is supported. Query variable isn't. We broke that. Uh, and the set variable is certainly not supported. <clears throat> and those are challenges, right? Uh, the, okay. There's not too many cases where you need runtime services or runtime variables anyway. You basically need them to configure your EFI boot manager. When the installer finishes up, you need to configure something. Uh, you need to control maybe some boot options, boot a different OS at some point in time. And it's needed if you want to do capsule updates. If you want to update your firmware, you need to set a special variable so you can trigger the capsule update on this. Yes. Yep. Uh, also, um, secure boot variable updates? Yes. Or is that? No, no. It's... That wasn't in your list there. Okay. So. Uh, Yes. Uh, P store, maybe, but we don't support that. And due to the implications, it's kind of impossible at the moment. It might be in the future, but no. Uh, the interesting part is that if you look two, two three years ago, the U-boot code wasn't doing something bad, right? It was returning not supported, but the installers were flashing a bit red screen, right? The installation failed. Nothing is going to work. I can't do anything. Uh, the funny part is that if you rebooted the board, everything was working fine because the EFI spec has a way of searching for a default named application and boot that, and the distro installers copied, used that naming. So we could boot perfectly fine. Uh, fortunately, that has changed. So if you install a distro now, you get a message that says, I can't set the variable. This might be a firmware bug. You'll probably be fine. Uh, so what we did do, uh, we tried to use the RPMB uh, whenever it was available. Again, we're on our own platforms. Uh, we have some prerequisites for that. Uh, the good thing is that the RPMB adheres to all the EFI needs. 
about storing secure variables. Um, what we did do is that there's an application in EDK2, which is called Standalone MM. Uh, it's basically responsible for all the cryptographic checks and all the variable checks you need for EFI. We didn't want to rewrite that. Uh, so we figured out that Standalone MM is self-relocatable to begin with, or was almost self-relocatable. Uh, and we managed to sandbox that thing and run it into Opti. Uh, so we had all of the cryptographic checks, uh, everything we needed, we could support uh, PK, all the authenticated variables, we could support them perfectly fine. The only thing that was missing is a very small layer between standalone MM and Opti. So when standalone MM was done processing, uh, it has an API with Opti that says, I'm done with the buffer processing, everything is fine, please go write that on the whatever medium you have. Uh, and that's that's the only piece of code that was missing. <clears throat> uh, there's a problem on that. Uh, the EMMC and the RPMB uh, are not in control of the firmware. They're not under the control of Opti. They're under the control of the OS. You boot or uh, the OS when it boots up. Uh, we have this requirement, which we're trying to change, but the requirement basically is that when Opti is done with the buffer processing, it dumps the buffer in user space. And there's a user space application that does an IO control to the MMC controller and writes that data. Uh, this is how it looks like. It's not that scary. <laughs> it's you basically enter into Opti, you transform that buffer into something that standalone MM understands. You go into standalone MM, does all the processing, sends your buffer back and said, I'm fine, everything is fine. Can you go please flush that? So eventually this ends up on your RPMB. Uh, and it does adhere to everything that the EFI spec says because it says you have to return from a set variable when you flushed everything on your on your final medium. Do um, you want me to stay on the slide, or shall I skip it? I mean, we can discuss it. There's a, even a mistake there. The reads are not from the RPMB, but that's basically what happens. I can questions or. Okay. All right. So this is not perfect. There's a few problems. The first problem is when you do try to do set variable at runtime, the kernel is supposed to call into a runtime preserve section from the firmware, which is remapped and it calls into magic code and then things happen and your variable is stored. Uh, Opti, so we should preserve Opti and standalone MM uh, from Uboot. That's fine. Uh, but there's this supplicant requirement. So when we exit the OS, enter the firmware, the variable gets processed, and when Opti comes out, it, Opti is now in firmware context, and it's trying to find the supplicant running on the same context, and it's not there because we haven't preserved that. So we can't complete the write. We could preserve a version of the supplicant on Uboot, but even if we did that, you need the drivers as well. You need to preserve the drivers on the firmware as well, and that's where it gets problematic, right? First of all, it's a huge amount of code, and second, uh, the MMC, yeah. So you're basically saying that uh, the boot stage uses a different supplicant than the runtime yes. stage, yes, right? Exactly. So you have to switch from one yeah, to exactly. the other. When Opti exits from that RPC call that it does, you're basically in firmware context and it tries yeah. to find the supplicant and it's not there. And even if, if you keep it, you need all of the machinery, right? You need the MMC drivers, and but the kernel is already in control of the MMC at that point. You can just go map it and do things. So is during the, the boot stage, is the supplicant provided by Yeah, yeah, by Uboot, by Uboot. So on the, uh, during, there's no problem on, on boot time. That's, that's dealt with, it works perfectly fine. The Uboot has a version of the supplicant, flushes everything on the RPMB. So what we did, uh, there's a few patches under review. Um, we tweaked Opti a bit and it has a discoverable bus. Basically, we have devices and services sitting on that bus, which is perfectly discoverable. Uh, the Opti module comes up, uh, we already use it, for example, if you have a firmware TPM, that's how the firmware TPM works. It's scannable on a bus and when Opti comes up, the firmware TPM comes up. Uh, so we plugged in standalone MM into that. Basically, there's a functionality in there that says, I can do EFI variables, I can do variables for you. So the Opti module comes up, uh, scans the bus and says, all right, I can, I can handle variables. Do you want me to do that for you? The tweak here is, because we rely on a user space application, the probe function that basically changes the runtime services on the kernel, that's what we do. We change the callbacks of the runtime and direct them directly to Opti. That doesn't happen when you load the module. 
that happens when you start the user space application that gives you access to the RPMB. And there's a few things happening in, the, in there. First of all, we swap the kernel callbacks. And second, we remount the EFI var file system as read-write because when the file system comes up, the firmware says, I don't do set variable. Uh, so it's mounted as read-only. So there's a chain notifier in there that once the supplicant comes up, that's the important bit. The probe function only runs when the supplicant comes up. Everything is mounted as read-write. And we now have a complete read uh, set variable implementation. Uh, good parts. It's fine. The RPMB is replay protected. You're kind of safe. Uh, standalone MM is self-relocatable and it's completely hardware independent. So you don't have to even recombine that binary. You can use the same binary across different hardware and it works perfectly fine. That's because the standalone MM is backed by the PI spec. The RPMB is backed by the MMC spec. So there's, it's literally hardware independent. There's not nothing you have to change on that application ever. Um, it solves the problem. You have set variable at runtime. You can do, you can enable secure boot at runtime. You can do capsule updates. You can do everything you want, and it solves all the distro problems. It breaks the EFI spec. <laughs> you don't go to the firmware. Well, technically it's firmware, but it's not the EFI firmware that you go to. Uh, the kernel relies on a user space application. Uh, that's not ideal, but that's always the case. I mean, we did that for the firmware TPM that that was pre-existing because before we did the whole thing. Uh, we did figure out we can get rid of it. Uh, it's not that simple because there's an ecosystem around the supplicant, but if you only need the RPMB accesses, we can move it into the kernel. We can basically be very careful about subsystem violations, but we can teach Opti to access the MMC subsystem and write that stuff directly, in which case you won't need the supplicant. The kernel will be completely self-sufficient on that. Uh, the writers are, are a bit slow. Uh, and it's, it's a bit weird because it depends on how good your EMMC driver is, Opti, how, how many cores you dedicate to Opti. Opti doesn't have its own scheduler. It gets scheduled by the kernel scheduler. And, it, and on top of that, it encrypts all the data it writes on the RPMB. So it might take some time. Uh, but arguably, when you're about to do a set variable, you're about to reboot anyway. So. And yeah, the entire solution is complex. You need you boot EDK2 and Opti to play along for that thing to work. But because everything is based on a spec, uh, that's probably the reason why it hasn't broken for three years. Uh, that's, the, that's the parts that we have on the RPMB. I'm going to stop now because I have a proposal about you know, the, the least, the, the worst solution of storing variables in the file. But that's, that's the part set on the RPMB. That's how things are working. Uh, there's one thing that we could discuss. How do we revert the file system from read-write when we unload the module? Unloading the module doesn't mean the file system is going to go to read-only. Uh, you need to unbind the service from the CSFS interfaces. Uh, that's a decision to you know, make the kernel simpler, have a single exit point from the kernel. Uh, because we have a file descriptor of the supplicant. If that dies, we could just revert it at the po at, at, on the spot. But that's an implementation detail because so with the supplicant case, right? If you if the kernel calls into a firmware service, like it disables pre uh, preemption and kind of locks the thread that's uh, calling it, is the the call into standalone EFI MM. into Opti into standalone MM back to the supplicant Black. back to user space? Is that like completely synchronous? So completely synchronous. Yes. So the CPU uh, CPU is blocked on that entire call stack, yeah. and then it comes the, all the, the way MM up. The MM buffer says you need to. The, the MM buffer specification says you need to keep the interrupt disabled, and we do that in Opti. And it's a bit of. We don't have to do it. Hmm. Uh, we've tried it without it. We haven't seen any implications, but hmm. the spec says we should do it. Uh, yeah. But we can look at it closer. Like I mean, if there's no problem, we can probably do it as well. Yeah, I would be a lot happier if the at least the supplicant runs in the kernel. Yeah. I mean, it's still kind uh, of inverted thing, but still. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a lot easier, right? Because yeah. I don't like the fact that if you keep the supplicant, the file system doesn't go to read only and you need to echo something on a special device. But we would introduce, you know, dual paths into the kernel about cleaning up stuff. And I don't like that either. So the what I came up with is that. I mean, on, the, on another file system, a write can 
fail if it's right. mounted read write. So that yeah. I'm not too concerned about. Yeah, exactly. It's first of all, it's not a big problem. Second, yeah. uh, we're gonna teach the supplicant to do that unbind when it dies. So we're gonna have a single uh, a signal handler in the supplicant that when it dies, it's gonna echo that thing into the unbind device. So we're gonna in user space. Yeah. Okay. So the supplicant is going to clean up for himself and you still have a still a one exit point from the kernel, which is, I think it's better. Okay. Awesome. So you, you've mentioned the two paths of using RPMB through the supplicant and using variables in a file, because you said that generally hardware doesn't have a like storage bus that's exclusive to secure worlds. Yes. That if you do have that, do, do, you that, can do everything. Yeah. So then you would also support that method as well. Just yes. everything happens in Opti and Opti does the storage. And we have to, okay, we have to change you to move some sections in runtime, but you don't have the hardware problem of, I don't have access to the hardware. So you would, does need a, a bit more work, but it's not huge. You do, okay. So that, that to mark some sections as runtime. Okay. So firstly, sorry, I don't know if you have more slides. Or if uh, just... I only had a discussion about variables on the file, but that's... Okay, so I don't know if... So I'm sure you know this. I don't know if everybody knows this. Would it be worth me just giving a super quick overview of how this works in the x86 world so we can kind of have a comparison? Yes. Uh, so x86, we typically have a couple of advantages that you don't usually have in the ARM world. Um, the first of those is that firmware typically has its own independent storage hardware. We typically have a piece of SPI flash which is not used by the operating system in any direct way. And on a typical x86 motherboard, that flash is connected to the motherboard chipset. And the motherboard chipset has functionality built into the SPI controller to allow various regions of that flash to be marked as reasonable and writable in different contexts. And one of the contexts you can set is that it can specific regions can only be written in system management mode. And for those of you unfamiliar with this, system management mode is kind of like a version of a trust zone that sucks even more. <laughs> uh, so unlike trust zone B, it's, so trust zone, you've got a basically completely separate world. System management mode is not a separate world. It's basically a separate protection level. Entering system management mode on a core stops all operating system access on that core. Typically for some of these things, we will synchronize all accesses. So all cores will end up transitioning into system management mode. And then system management mode is able to write to areas of the flash that the normal operating system can't. And there's no synchronization issues there because while the firmware can choose to expose the SPI controller, but then SPI is a sufficiently simple protocol that it can just ensure that there's, it can save any state that's in the controller, do its access, and then restore the state. So this is transparent to the OS. Uh, so that simplifies a bunch of this stuff at the cost of we end up having to put signature validation code in system management mode, and then there's no internal protection in system management mode, so any vulnerabilities there would be the entirety of system management mode is now a disaster, and we lose badly. So far, nobody's found one of those vulnerabilities. Uh, so, but I think a sort of follow-up to that is, um, Obviously, the spec somewhat centers around assumptions that were made in the x86 world. Exactly. And so I think we should not go into this model with, into any of these conversations with a concern that remaining true to the letter of the EFI spec is a hard requirement for anything to be considered acceptable, especially because if you believe that in any other context, people believe that a strict alignment with the EFI spec is a requirement, you're going to be extremely disappointed. <laughs> Well, I do have one question um, first up. Uh, so firstly, do you know how Windows on ARM handles no. this? No, I, I haven't. Uh, do you? I, they, they do it on reboot or? No, they basically have what we have with the EFR, EFI virus register thing. They allow yeah, uh, like new, a... They, Windows on ARM, not Linux. They merge that, they merge the similar thing uh, for Qualcomm laptops running a, uh, Linux. So, so Windows, Microsoft allowed Qualcomm to provide something that just hooks the the, the higher level variable access uh, code in Windows to use something else than calling the EFI so rental services. Basically the same thing. Yeah, that's why they implemented this yeah. like way, this way. So it's like some uh, Opti trusted OS yeah. 
interface and uh, they just swap out these function pointers entirely. So the, yeah, that, that's exactly the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah, but I'm assuming in their case, they have dedicated storage that they can access directly from the secure world without requiring this supplicant. I'm not sure. It's, it's, it's worthwhile to point out that this is on the client part too. The server part is just done. Yeah. Uh, the Windows on ARM, right? The server version just has normal runtime variable yeah. support. It doesn't yeah. do the whole PEP thing, calling back into the kernel and letting a random driver run, right? Uh, so, yeah, Windows client on ARM, um, my understanding is that in modern versions of Windows, the typical model here is not that Windows is expected to run on a generic ARM laptop, but that the vendor is required to provide a HAL layer. And whether that then implements stuff in user land or in kernel space, I'm not sufficiently aware of the details, but it does mean that the SOC vendor can just provide a shim that is able to speak to hardware itself without any uh, OS level drivers or user land being involved in the process if it wanted to. Yeah, that's, that, I mean, the idea is not... Great, so it doesn't sound like, yeah. if you're concerned about violating the spec, then it no, sounds no, no. like the spec <laughs> is, woo. That's, that's the least of my concerns, I'm just mentioning it. Yeah. So, um, and one final question I had, which is, I think you just alluded to this. Um, so this is all obviously required if you want synchronous updates of variables. And an alternative is that instead of actually writing stuff to RMBR, you could stage stuff in firmware own memory, and then on reboot, that can yes. be applied in the... U-Boot environment. Yeah. Uh, so there are some trade-offs there. Um, obviously, that approach seems simpler, but that's the so this is... Yeah, that's the value. Okay, so I think when you said file, I, I was sort of thinking not necessarily in file, but in yeah. RAM um, rather than hitting file system, um, which then leaves everything entirely up to you and U-Boot to negotiate. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, I mean, I think that the RPMB, we should keep the synchronous one. Uh, if you're storing variables on a file, which is, okay, you would specific for now, but we're trying to standardize it, then that's that's what this slide is supposed to explain. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we deal with that? And we're trying to stage it on memory. Right. So you would then obviously have to itself replay all the authentication no. stuff and verify uh, we, that before. If applying. the variables are on a file, we just don't, we say we don't support authentication. That's it. Right. But you could. Uh, okay. U-Boot has access to all the information it would need to do what that. we do, okay, uh, what we do to support UEFI Secure Boot on if, but if you don't have an RPMB is that we have a section on the U-Boot executable and we preserve the PK there. So we hope that you do the right thing and you do chain of trust. And if U-Boot does chain of trust, the only place that it can convince itself to load platform keys is the U-Boot binary itself. You can't change them. We don't allow you to write them. We don't do anything. You have to update the entire U-Boot if you want to update DB, et cetera, but that's... Oh, sure. Yeah, if there's no authenticated storage exactly. on the platform, that's exactly. completely unavoidable. Yeah. I'm looking at Jeremy to keep me honest here, but don't we do that on RPI4 with the Tiano Core? Like uh, have the writes uh, basically cached in memory somewhere and then write them back when you do a uh, reset system? Uh, it's just really frustrating because uh, you know every time I look at these platforms, it's this is a board problem. It's not even a hardware problem. There's SPI controllers all over these SOCs that you can take over. You just have to basically attach yes. the ten cents worth of SPI flash to them. Yeah. I agree. Assuming the board does have a spy flash, that, what's the solution there, right? Okay. Do we have like uh, a, a platform that has a spy flash connected in the secure world? Or... So, like, I'm just thinking of some of the the boards I'm familiar with. They have a spy flash that right now is is not on the secure world. Uh, it's it's used to store U-boot and possibly a say image containing Linux in the U-boot envir environment and that sort of thing. Yeah, but then you but, got, you need to convince the board to be able to boot from that flash if you move it on the secure world. So, well, I mean, they all come up in the secure world to start with. So the, the you know normally we just say delegate this to the non-secure world. Well, if we just didn't do that, yeah. right? How, how would that solve the problem? Would we be able to use that spy flash directly? And yes, maybe if you wanted to say allow like a portion of that flash to be writable from the non-secure world, use something like I don't know Vert IO or something you know crazy to delegate access to a portion of the of the flash. Yes, you could do that. Yeah, 
Uh, if you have direct access to SPI, then you can modify all of the authenticated variables without any authentication yes. on typical x86 port. And that's, as far as the EFI specs is concerned, that's completely fine. The actual level of security you want is more of a, EFI doesn't care about that. That's a board design. That's a, uh, what is your threat model kind of scenario. I know that there are ARM parts that do end up keeping this in basically, um, I've seen places where there are ARM parts where they set SPI flash and they appear to have been storing stuff there. And then that's encrypted with a key that's in trust zone, that's trust zone that. So there's no um, physical attack is suddenly a much more difficult scenario. But as far as the spec concern, is concerned, yeah, whatever. So you, you allow the non-secure world. Are you saying it's fine to give the non-secure world access to the spy controller as long as there's some sort of like encryption done on the flash itself that so only the, the secure world can access that portion of the flash that it, need, it, it cares to be authenticated? Uh, I'd say that as far as the spec's concerned, sure. Um, I, the effect in that scenario would basically be it's a denial of service kind of thing. You'd still be able to override all the variables and then the behavior of the platform would be inconsistent. Uh, you probably want some sort of reasonable fallback then, because if I'm just able to corrupt your variable store as user land, then if the outcome is secure boot gets disabled, <laughs> then exactly. that's a change in the security state. Yeah. So that, but that's an implementation detail again. Uh, you, you need to think through what your implementation choices actually mean. Um, but the spec itself. We could solve all that, right? But it's kind of platform specific because you could have a fallback. You could have you could write stuff in a file and say I trust it, but I have a fallback. And if the file gets corrupted, I'm gonna load what I have on my binary. Right. Like if, if you have some sort of authenticated encryption, you 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 can verify that, you know, you can know that it's been tampered with, right? And you can know to reject that and, and fall back to your default variables, which presumably have some sort of default key that you have. Yeah, you can. we can use a TPM, we can do a bunch of stuff. The point is find the least common denominator for platforms that are out there that work and then pick it up, right? Because yeah, we can authenticate the file in the end. Right, yeah, I'm trying to think of like or what, what yeah. works for your small boards that yeah. like, you know, the, the minimum is you have RPMB, but maybe one step above that is you have a spy controller that's yeah. used for maybe flash and other things that you can't dedicate to the secure world, but at least you, you, can, you can use that. And so as an analogy here, in the x86 world, several firmware uh, vendors do keep the firmware configuration just in an EFI variable and frequently not even an authenticated one and frequently one that is not boot service only. Uh, so in that scenario, you can just set variable over there. If you're root, then yeah, you can just smash something in there. And if that leaves you in an inconsistent, normally security specific stuff is elsewhere. But even so, setting that to an inconsistent state will generally just result in the firmware resetting back to platform defaults. And the platform vendor, you are having to trust your platform vendor to some extent in all scenarios. Uh, so I, my assumption would be the platform vendor would, in terms of factory default, would get you back to whatever the original uh, storage keys were. Now, there is an issue there in that that's a world where suddenly you're able to, um, if you can get DBX, back to factory state, then you're suddenly able to boot insecure bootloaders again. And that is not necessarily the expected outcome. Uh, but that is a harder problem to solve. Even, I don't see a way to avoid this in this case, but it's still better than I can disable secure boot entirely. And if it's a, if that's coming from U-Boot, then that's still a update to a newer version of U-Boot that has a newer default version of DBX and it's less of a big deal. I'm, I'm approaching this from the perspective of like, you know, d providing third party distributions of U-Boot for existing boards where maybe like, the, obviously we'd like to have the most secure board possible, but the security properties are less important to some extent than just having something that follows enough of the spec that we can do board independent OS installers. That's... So like, what, can we follow EBBR and, and the secure boot is, is great, but it's not, part, it's, a... it's not mandated by EBBR. It's an op, it's optional. It right. It's, it's, a, it's but... a secondary concern. Yeah. And in the majority of these sorts of, especially consumer ARM worlds, uh, what we're talking about here, if U boots just on the file system, then unless user, end users are choosing to fuse their boards into imposing secure boot at the SOC level, it doesn't matter. You can just replace U boot, and then none of this matters anyway. So unless you're getting into that level of um, security, 
then the ability to like get stuff back into a default state doesn't matter because there's easier ways of subverting the entire trust chain anyway. Thanks. Got it. Um, so you, you in, in the previous example, you were basically showing how you how you um, did the whole path all the way to to user space in order to essentially just execute a binary that is pre-known, right? Like you, you know exactly how to implement all the variable services with EBR, we have a standardized, standardized file format, everything, yada, yada. Why don't we just implement the calls in Linux and call it a day? You, you have to have a pan over anyways that tells you where that file is. If I, if I understand yeah, the sentiment in the, in the room correctly, the security properties of this are pretty much irrelevant because once you are in that world where you actually care about full, a full secure boot path, by all means, build a board that has a dedicated spy flash and, and, and use that, right? But for the general purpose, random SPC world out there that you just want to run on, you want a viable UEFI based boot path with variables, but without necessarily security properties, right? And yes. for that, so, you just need to standardize on a file format and in a location, the kernel needs to follow the same procedures when it updates variables and you don't. Yeah, so the, the RPMB problem uh, is scannable at boot time. So we fix that if, if we fix that up and boot time if we have. What you're talking about is finding a common denominator for boards that don't have that hardware. Yeah. So that's okay. I'm gonna do the variables on a file if I how much yeah have 10 minutes. Uh, that's the proposal, right? We discussed about this. Uh, we have a standardized format of EFI variables in EBBR now. We're saying this is how it's supposed to be stored if you want to use them. So we have that in the standard, we merged it, we have the discussion of Maybe we can reason about the security, but it gets way too complicated and way too circumstantial. So we're not going to do that. We're going to kick it, secure boot variables out. If you want to do secure boot, just bake them into your firmware, right? And and uh, we do the same thing, right? When we have variables on a file, we boot up, copy them in memory, preserve them on runtime. So the kernel has get it, get get in, get next one. Now, the question is, how do we solve the right problem uh, on those platforms? So you can get EFI on those platforms with distros booting up, uh, even if you know you have just an SD card. So there's three possible solutions that I came up with. So the first one was that we ignore everything with TTFI tools, how to write that file directly. Don't, don't yeah, I know, ignore, I know. ignore that option, <laughs> not there. Next. Uh, so that's the only one you can warn about failures, right? That's, that's the only advantage of teaching the EFI tools. I know it's horrible, I just have it in there to for completeness. So the second one is that we teach the firmware to do set variable at runtime and it writes stuff on memory. And we have a watcher application on the EFI var file system. And when a change happens, we just sync the variables on the file. Uh, that's perfectly doable. The only problem is that if writing the file fails, we won't be able to notify the kernel. You can just have the kernel write it to a location. Yeah, that's the third one. Tells you. Yeah, that's the third one. Replace the articles like yeah. we did and yeah, do, write the file directly from Sounds the great. kernel. Thumbs up. You get it. Do I it. don't know if that's the best one because I don't know how we can access. I don't know how easy it's going to be to access a file from the kernel. Teach the kernel that. You, you don't need to access a file. You need to get a. Um, uh, a, a block device and offsets. Yeah. You can get the block device using a device descriptor before. You get offsets in that, and then you just have a contiguous, um, a, a, a block contiguous piece of memory that is your backing store. And then you just use that. Uh, Art, what were you asking? Oh. File has to be contiguous in the file system? Okay. Or, or not even file. It may just be a partition. Or, or have user space provide a file descriptor and say, well, here's a file descriptor, have the kernel write to that file descriptor. Yeah, something like that. But we can do the same thing, right? We can install a config table or an EFI something, if a configuration table uh, that says the kernel, okay, the variables are going to be on a file. You need to expect the file descriptor. But once you get that, just go and replace the runtime calls and do the same thing. So we don't touch EFI tools. We don't touch anything. Everything works. The EFI tools right on the var file system. The kernel says, I have a changed version of set variable. I'm just going to flush stuff into a file and I'm done. Presumably it's all like on ESP or something from the kernel. Yeah, it's on the ESP. The file is on the ESP. Why doesn't ARM fix this in hardware? I'm Leonardo. He... <laughs> <laughs> but the hardware I already have. Not supported. 
if you did have a uh, defined mechanism by which trust zone could speak to the RMBR without, a, without the operating system having to be involved, and you had defined synchronization mechanisms around this, then this could be dealt with without. We already asked for a dual MMIO access on the RPMB. We never got anything. 11 years ago. Sorry? 11 years ago. <laughs> you're, also, you're also assuming that assuming that um, we, we have a stack where you own EO3, where you do have trust on always available, which may also not be the case, where um, people that build these stacks actually have any clue on how to integrate all these Opti applications in addition, the easier we can make this, the better for the simple use case, right? I'm, I'm not talking about the secure one. For the secure one, you, you absolutely want to have the full stack going all the way top to bottom, but they are just make your hardware actually fine and then you're good, right? Um, for for the SBC random thing, I take something off the shelf and build random code from the internet case. Just give them something that writes random variables to a file. So if, if you leave out the, the secure boot key certificates case, what, what variables are we actually manipulating here? Which variables are we actually manipulating here? Is non -authenticated it just non-authenticated. Yeah, so it's just the the installer that yeah. sets boot zero 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 one. And the OS indications if you need to do captions. Yeah, but nobody does that. I mean, if you're well, not even implementing that. this, we then that. yeah, we do that. That's the point. We specifically have a U-boot flag that says ignore OS indications, <laughs> and we do caption update if we find the file. Okay. Just to open the can of worms, um, I think it would be amazing to have that uh, in kernel implementation of set variable be in the Rust. No. You uh, take you take Art's code. <laughs> uh, the file one. Second. The, the file access one. N no, the just just basically the the actual set variable and get variable implementations the... that go and access something from that file and give you. The respective output. The get variable you can probably cache, but for set variable you would need to the go. Get variable is already uh, okay. right. So you, you're caching anyways yeah. usually, right? So that, that one is not an issue, but um, you could just implement a caching implementation very easily. But for set variable, I don't know. You don't have to. You can even even do it in like hundred lines of C. Okay. It's, it's okay. No, that's, that's just do it. Just just no, write it fine. down. Send it. I, I really think we are, we've been talking to the file about this for way too long. Well, the, the, the whole point was to standardize the file format, right? If we agree on the yes. file format, which the spec doesn't, that's, that's all we need. Exactly. I mean, I can give you another file format if you like, but <laughs> just use that. No, that. It's done. And then we, so the, the one piece that you are missing is um, the handover. So how does UEFI tell the kernel where that file resides? Protocol, maybe, or a, a configuration one. table, or a. It could be a variable, but the variable would need to contain a device path. Yeah, no, no, just Which configuration. Table no, you're right. Actually, it could be a variable. Protocol, something like the load file too. All right. So basically, just to inform the OS where the file well, actually the file lives. Is. Don't just have a standard name in the ESP. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I think standardizing name the. Partition probably works. Um, I think there would be a risk that since this isn't defined, then someone's potentially put something there already and find they ignore the spec if that's not a namespace place. So uh, you can probably guess away with that. And if you just, but then you do have the problem of on systems that have multiple ESPs, which is annoying but legitimate. Then do you really want the kernel to be making that policy decision? Anything you can do a runtime call and we can respond from Uboot that. This is the file path that you need to access. But well, we've got at least like four ways for the yeah. firmware to pass information to the OS. It's just pick one of them. It's fine. Those are nodes. Pick one. <laughs> I would I'd go with config tables just because yeah, they're cool. Yeah, config tables to keep but... everything EFI instead of you know going and meddling again DT and just keep one way. Yeah, but the config table with the device path would work, right? And if we have an in-kernel driver, that's... Can the kernel map uh, device paths to whatever? I don't know. <laughs> I have to check that. I can't be certain of this, 
but I believe that up until last week, it probably could because someone probably relies on that in titanium. <laughs> titanium. <laughs> Fair enough. Thanks.